Thank you. No, it's actually uh, great to be here, and uh, pretty soon I'll be in uh, Brown Sub with uh, Reverend Billy Davis, uh, and that's, that will be pure, you know, African-American uh, blues, uh, church music, and uh, go outside and dodge a few bullets, and I'll feel at home. Um, yeah, this book, I'm so lucky to have Pam McMillan as the publisher. I've never, I've never seen a book like it. It's, um, it's like my diaries. And um, I don't know what their budget was, but it was like a feature film budget. They, uh, they had the best designer in Australia, um, Daniel New, and he came to my place and we put it together to look like one of these. I just couldn't believe it. I thought it was going to be like uh, the Brett Whiteley book or something where it's all pages and um, you know, a few pictures here and there. And just since I finished it, I've realised that I've done, I'm an artist and in this book there's not one reference to an exhibition. Um, not one reference to a review. Not re one reference to a painting sale. Not even a reference to winning an art prize. And I look at books by other artists and uh, usually, you know, they have their early days and they find a dealer and then at the milestones of one exhibition after another and the poor writer has to find, uh, you know, some sexy stories about their extramarital relationships and their drug dealing and, and then they're out of it, you know, they're out of here. And the thing that I've never really understood is that you know, I've, I've got the, you know, the biographies of Jackson Pollock and he's terribly brave when he decides to drip paint directly out of a can. That's an act of incredible courage. And uh, Matisse, you know, there's about three chapters on how much Matisse agonised on deciding to use flat areas of colour rather than modelled colour. He got dermatitis. He had almost had a nervous breakdown over this decision to... And the writers think that this, um, you know, was an act of incredible courage. In the meantime, his son was going off and fighting uh, in the First World War and there was war all around, but somehow other the flat areas of colour were it. So, um, yeah, so I didn't do this intentionally, but it's true. And I, I think that uh, most of my friends' uh, children who became heroin addicts sort of thank Brett Whiteley for it. Um, there's the idea that you've got to um, take drugs to get there, to get into that special zone, that special place, so that you can draw like Brett, which is nonsense, you know. Um, so I'd, I'd like to think that this book is a model for a different kind of art, and uh, an art where you can go out and engage with the world. I'm about to head off at 66 to Brown Sub, and, uh, I, I, you know, the way I am is I feel for the world, you know, like it's very hard not to be in, in Aleppo at the moment, in Syria, but uh, all of this, we'll get this rolling, shall we? Uh, all of this started with, um, with uh, me going to America in 1968 to work with the uh, African-American community with civil rights, the year that Martin Luther King was killed, and now we're seeing uh, more blacks killed in, in Chicago with gun-related violence than American soldiers were ever killed in one year in, in Iraq, and where I'm going in Brown Sub, it's even worse. So um, there's George Giddos. I've, I've uh, always had this problem. There's my dear mother, you know, terrified out of her mind. It's not a normal baby photo. Uh, <coughs> Dad's got his legs crossed. You know, I'm a baby that came out of World War II. All these guys have been off and uh, fought the Germans and the Japs and, you know, just wanted to come home and relax. Keep going. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little bit too frank and I embarrass people all the time and I think I've had that in the gene from the start. Um, this was the first painting I did that won an art prize and um, partly inspired, we saw the James Dean movie where, uh, you know, the boys steal cars and they drive them to the edge of the cliff and, the, you know, one poor boy's clothes get caught in a... Uh, handle of the car and he goes over the cliff, but you're chicken if you, if you jump out too soon. So I had the bright idea of getting all our billy carts, lighting them up and on the top of a hill heading down to a precipice and the last one to jump out would not be the chicken. 
And uh, suddenly this kid next to me, all the others had dropped out. He was just, you know, he was, he was dead ill. He, he, he wasn't going to pull up. And he pulled up right on the rim. And so I went over and I thought, oh, this is not good. <laughs> this is not good. Went down and um, my, uh, there was a big metal can at the bottom and went right through my foot. Came home and um, mum said, just put your foot in the bath. I don't want to see it. And my sister took me to St George Hospital and the doctor talked to me and he said, look, mate, you know, you're only a kid but you're one chop short of a Barbie. And I said, what's that, doctor? <laughs> and he said, you just don't have fear, do you? And it's still the same. Like Peter just asked me, how do I feel going to Brown Sub? Well, Brown Sub is more dangerous than Iraq or Afghanistan or anything because the gun violence and I'll be linking myself with... Crack cocaine gangs that are selling drugs and th they'll be nice to me but the um, gangs that are fighting them won't be. And there are these moments in my life which is always like that Billy card again where, like, you know, the book opens with me um, flying into Afghanistan over the mountains and I'm looking down and in my pocket I've got a letter from, recent letter delivered to the Australian Embassy in Islamabad offering to cut my head off if I came back. And uh, so it's always that moment of going over the cliff and uh, I've overworked my guardian angels. Um, that's my grandfather, George Halpin. There I am up on the horse. Uh, he was a, uh, born in Australia, but Irishman, orange Irishman, the toughest man I've ever met. You know, he, uh, when he needed money when he was younger, he'd go into a country town, pick the toughest guy in the bar, they'd go out the back and he'd have a few cronies that no one knew were his mates and he'd take a terrible beating until the odds were completely against him. The blo his mates would take the bets, it was a scam, and then he'd take the poor guy apart. And sometimes the cops would put him, you know, get him and put him in jail. So he taught me to ride a horse and, and fight. At about the age of five he turned up with a bucket of sand and I said, what's that poor grandfather? And he said, you've got to punch it, you know, constantly. So uh, when, I, when I was in... Um, in Afghanistan recently working with the street gangs there, the leader of the street gang grabbed my hand and looked at my knuckles and he felt comfortable with me because he could see that I'd been a fighter. So thanks to George Halpin. <laughs> Keep going. And there he is, he won the Tattlesall's Cup, probably rigged it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, just not long, uh, when I was about 14, uh, I was walking up, the street, and I thought I'd done everything to please my grandfather, and two big thugs came out and started beating, really beating me, you know, and beating into me. But I stood my ground, and one of them finally apologised, and he said, uh, "Your grandfather, it's not personal. Your grandfather paid paid us to do it." And uh, so I went down to mum, you know, really badly, you know, damaged, and she said, "What have you done?" Took me up to grandfather. I can still see his face. He's having a shave, and he turned around. And he said, "Oh, George didn't do nothing." You know, he, he, he just needed to learn to take a beating, you know. So um, I don't know how many times I've been beaten, tortured, <laughs> intimidated. And so the, the artist at George Giddo's couldn't do what I've done if it hadn't been for George Halpin. So it was strange. It was like my mother was an artist, even though she was his daughter. And um, she was making ceramics and she was a bohemian. She'd walk around the house naked and all this sort of stuff. But um, I'd be at home with her and my sister was an artist and then I'd go up to George Halpin and he, I was young George, he was old George and I was going to take over the small time crime that he ran uh, when I got old enough. So I got away from him and I was lucky, I, I got, I don't know how, but I got to Sydney University and my professor, um, uh, Bernard Smith, brought Clement Greenberg, the great American art critic to Australia and I was the only artist uh, student that Bernard had that was doing anything that looked like minimalism. And uh, this is one of the, my paintings from 1967. And Greenberg actually liked them and he said, oh, you're wasting your time. You know, you're wasting your time here. You know, this place is a dump. Come to, <laughs> come to New York. And uh, so I, you know, got a job on the Carl Expressway as a chainman and I went to New York. And uh, that absolutely changed my life. And that's when I started working with civil rights and everything else. When I came back, I created a puppet theatre, a portable one, 
And this is in the first Aquarius Festival in, um, in Canberra. And uh, Martin Sharp had his incredible shrinking exhibition where he hung his pictures on the trees and I had the theatre. And I also had the Yellow House Puppet Theatre. But that's how it all started for me with puppets because uh, people say, George, how can you fit into communities, you know, like Afghanistan and Iraq and everywhere else? Well, in Rockdale, where we grew up, in Villiers Street, there were only two families that had an English-Irish background. The rest were all refugees from World War II, all speaking many languages. Mo a lot of them were Maltese, very interested in the Maltese girls across the road, so I'd go over there and eat Maltese food and try and learn a bit of Maltese lingo. And the um, Italian boys formed a gang and they'd fight us. And so it was very, very all of that. And it was before television, so I started doing puppets just while I was still in primary school. Dad came home one weekend, there were 300 kids on the back lawn, you know, absolutely riveted by my puppets. And um, so Dad passed the hat around and he'd heard about the Red Cross. <laughs> and um, that's how, how it started because the Red Cross were very interested in this kid that was raising all this money for the Red Cross. So they sent Red Cross people to me and told me all about Florence Nightingale and what the Red Cross was doing all over the world. And that had tremendous satisfaction for me. That story is in the book. And um, there I am coming back from America. Mum made the mistake of telling all four of my girlfriends what the day I was arriving, so <laughs> that was a total disaster. <laughs> and there I am. Uh, this is the day that I met Martin Sharp and uh, going into King's Cross. Sorry about the singlet. The songs. Uh, the songs, yeah. And... Um, yeah, keep going. And there's the Yellow House uh, that we were talking about earlier. Uh, Martin had been in um, England um, with the pheasantry and, you know, England Swings and uh, Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles and uh, Tiny Tim and everything. And I'd actually worked with uh, Andy Warhol in New York and that's how I first picked up a movie camera. It's one of the funniest experiences in the book, how I met Andy Warhol. I'd I'd been doing a portrait of a, an Austrian baroness and she didn't like the way I'd painted her and I was coming back with the improvements. And uh, she actually loved the final version and gave me a bronze crucifix, an Udamara print, the great Japanese printer, and a thing that must be worth millions, uh, a photograph of Arthur Rambeau taken by Carl Jart. And it's signed by Rambeau, the great poet, and, and he slashed it. It, belong, it had belonged to Verlaine, his lover. And so I was coming back with these things. And uh, at that time, I thought, well, you know, I'll go into a bookshop. And I wanted to get a book on the medieval anchoress Julian of Norwich. And uh, there's this warlock who had a kind of crazy um, devil worshipper sort of a bookshop. And I went down there and he looked exactly like Andy Warhol. He had the same hair, the same silver hair and everything. And you can imagine a surfy boy who looked like what I looked like a minute ago, uh, walking in and saying, I want a book on a medieval anchoress. So he sent me down to the end of the shop. When I came back, his double was standing next to him and it was Andy Warhol. And it turned out that Andy Warhol used to go and get this guy to go and give lectures and no one knew the difference <laughs> until they were... <laughs> They were both caught because Andy was, you know, bored by public speaking. And uh, I found myself chatting with them and I had the suddenly I had the crucifix and I'm swinging it upside down, which the devil guy loved, and Andy thought it was a great joke. So he walked me home and uh, I was in 7th, uh, 14th Street and 7th Avenue and he was in, um, in Union Square, so it's, it's, it's also 14th Street. So we became good, close friends. Now, Andy, Andy is the one, I never hear a bad word against Andy, he's the one who taught me how to use a movie camera. Um, so here we go. And that's my puppet theatre at the Yellow House. Um, I've always loved Islamic art. When I went to Kingsgrove North High School, I uh, persuaded um, the art teacher to let us do Islamic art for the high school certificate. No, there were no textbooks on it. And... Uh, she said, all right, George, if you can get 12 other students who will do it, and I persuaded them all to do it. So you've got a few famous art historians like Joanna Mendelssohn now that have got a great background in Islamic art. 
And so that, that was the influence. Keep going. That's Bruce Gould and Bliss were doing. In those days we did performance art but they were called happenings and, um, and our rooms, which you now call installation art, were called, called environmental art. There's me uh, with Johnny Lewis and uh, I've just performed The Fox in the, uh, in, you know, we, we did a dramatisation of um, uh, the, you know, the Little Prince and we did that for Martin because Martin was a bit of a, a little prince. It's my sister and her husband looking shocked and <laughs> <laughs> at the yellow house. Here we go. There's a black and white, keep going, the puppet theatre. These just this is just some lovely installation shots of the yellow house. We all worked on that's the um, the bonsai room and that was an amazing collaboration. I did the table, my mother did the the ceramics. It was based on a Magritte lithograph. Martin and Brett literally fought each other over painting this wave and uh, I did the stone. So it was one time when all the artists came together, Peter Kingston came in at the end and created this amazing room. Hippies used to go in there, we call it the stone room, but they used to call it the room to go and get stoned in. <laughs> and uh, there I am, there's Bruce Gould, myself and Marie Brebauer. That's one of the saddest things in, in my book in that Marie was an artist I met in America and she came to Australia and wanted to marry me. I was only 21 and uh, she killed herself. And um, I say in the book how uh, finding her, some cops took me down to the Glebe morgue and suddenly the, the drawer got pulled out and here's my girlfriend, you know, she's taken an overdose. I bent down and kissed her and this big burly cop was shocked and pulled me back. And of all the dead bodies I've seen, I've probably seen more death than anyone on earth. Um, Marie's was the worst and I think that gave me a degree of immune, a little bit of immunisation for being able to handle Rwanda and all the other places. It took me decades to get over Marie's death. And there she is and there's Julian. I tell some wonderful stories about the shows we did in King's Cross but you'll have to get the book to read those. And... At the end of the Yellow House, um, it was like the time, you know, we helped put together the Nimbin Festival, but hippies had moved in, had taken over everything. And they had a, uh, a meeting without Martin Sharp and myself, and they said the Yellow House should be a place more for people to live and a change of lifestyle, and their idea of good art was tie-dyed clothes and, and big beads, you know. And... Uh, from their perspective, you could go and sit in a storm water drain and take acid and it'd be as good as being in my puppet theatre. And there was just one night where um, we had Brett Robertson there who had a flying saucer cult that believed Jesus was about to come back on a flying saucer. A, lot of the, a couple of the most serious Yellow House artists actually joined that cult. And uh, Jesus Adams, and the place was just crazy and Martin and I decided that it was over. And, um, you know, we sat together in a cafe and we said, you know, we should do this in Vietnam. And he was right, but neither of us knew how to do it. And a beautiful thing, in the last <coughs> years of Martin's life, when he was dying from, um, from a lung disease, uh, I'd come back with photos and films from the Yellow House in uh, Jalalabad and it was like he'd been there with us. It was like we created that together and it was like... Finally, in our old age, we'd fulfilled <laughs> our dream, you know. And uh, so I felt very, very empty because this experience of the, the hippies and stuff. And no, we should just go back for a second. And so I wrote to Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I'm not a Catholic, but I'd read uh, Malcolm Muggeridge's book on her and I was very impressed. And I said, uh, Mother, do you think if I went back to university and studied as a doctor or an engineer, I could do more good? I don't think an artist can contribute much in this world. You know? And she sent me this lovely letter back saying that I was lucky to have the gifts I had. And I read that as her telling me that um, if I use my artistic skills to help others, like, you know, like a doctor, like Medicine Sans Frontiers or something like that... Um, I'd be happy and fulfilled. And so here I am, a 66-year-old. People are shocked that I haven't got post-traumatic stress. I've been through Rwanda and Bosnia and all these places. But I'm very fulfilled and happy because I followed her advice to the letter. I've used my artistic skills 
not the skills of an engineer or a doctor or of a soldier with a gun to try and bring light and happiness to places of great darkness, you know, war zones. We go, and that's, that's our latest creation, that's our main crew at the Yellow House. There's the old Sufi in the centre and Niha who, who runs the workshops with my partner Helen and some of the ice cream boys and little Ashid who's a metre tall and uh, 27 years old and uh, Murtazar, the music master. So it's very much like the original Yellow House. We have different disciplines with different masters and uh, the Yellow House in Jalalabad is thriving. And um, one of the first times I discovered what I needed to do with the kind of films I want to make in war zones is people think that maybe I'm, you know, belong to the same school of journalists as people like Neil Davis, you know, these people who do war journalism. But what's different about my film is that they're all about not the fighters but the creative people in war zones. So, um, the first documentary I made in War Zone was Nicaragua in 1986, and keep going. And it was with the um, the women poets of Nicaragua. It's called Bullets of the Poets. I just sent it to P. J. Harvey, <coughs> Polly, who's doing a tour around the world. She's a great poet and woman singer, and she loved seeing this film. She said, "You know, George, if I, I was if I'd been around in 1986, I would have joined them." And uh, so these were women using poetry to bring about an, a revolution. <coughs> um, the worst experience of my life was Kabaya. This is Kabaya camp in Rwanda. And on the right, your left, uh, there's 250,000 people alive. And on the right, there's 250,000 people dead. And uh, with a group of very brave Australian soldiers who'd gone there just to create a little... Uh, field hospital, um, I lived through the days of Kabaya with incredible slaughter, mainly with machetes. And um, the bravest man I ever met, and in many ways the blood mystic is dedicated to him as the preacher, and he is what I define as a blood mystic. Blood mystics <coughs> are people who don't go into war zones or, or plagues or any place of great human death and stress, with guns, they go in to help. And it's their faith in a, it's something mystical beyond the material life that um, gives them the courage to do this. So I was in, in Cabello and um, that morning I'd woken up and I went to go and have a piss and there was like a, a ditch with a wood over it and a little hole you could stand in and piss into, no privacy. Now, I just unzipped my fly and I looked down this hole and there's a woman looking up at me. Fortunately, I didn't piss. And she had two babies that she'd had down there in the shit and the piss all night and a couple of other kids and that's how she'd survived the massacre of the night. And I pulled her out. Then I went to the next ladder and, and uh, there was a man down there who'd gone mad and he was actually lying in the, in the, at the bottom. And we dragged him out but he just wouldn't you know, couldn't come out of it. And um, eventually the RPA, the killers, came and just shot him. And uh, people everywhere had lost their dignity. But I came into this and here was this preacher reading in a beautiful voice from the, uh, in French, from the New Testament, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, and he'd given them their dignity back. And um, I said to him, look, do you think if I stayed here, uh, they may not kill you. And he said, George, we're more likely to be killed. They've told us they want to kill you because what I was doing by taking photographs was doc documenting them as war criminals. So he gave me a, a few orphan children that he'd been entrusted with during the night. I got them out and when I came back he had been killed. And um, so as soon as I got back to Australia, uh, I wanted to do a painting which would embody his courage, and that's the painting that won the Blake Prize, the painting of the preacher. And uh, another young woman, when you're, when you're in a place, a day, the reason why I can come away from something like that and not be personally damaged is that I use every minute that I'm there to save lives. And it's very hard as an artist to stop and just spend time drawing, because in the time you're drawing someone, you can help someone, you know, to a doctor or... To safety 
And uh, I saw this young girl, she'd been, had the head, head, her name was Immaculate. She'd been chopped in the head, which means she'd had meningitis. She couldn't possibly live. And um, I said to uh, the doctor, you know, can we get some morphine? And she said, George, she's beyond morphine. Why don't you just, she must have felt sorry for me. Why don't you just sit down and, um, and draw her? And uh, I did this drawing. And... Um, Immaculate looked at me, you know, and, <coughs> and she said, why are you doing this drawing? And I said, uh, because I want the world to see what was done to you. And uh, so she hung on to her consciousness. I could see her life leaving her body. And I've, I've, I've withheld, I've, I've maintained that promise to her. I've, that painting is on the cover of the Gavin Fry book. It's in this book. We can keep on going. And... Um, it's, uh, I've kept working and working and working with her. The world knows Immaculate's story. Um, yeah. So that's my, my obligation to her. And this is my son, Harley. One of my closest friends, is, and I'm terribly lucky to have as a friend, is Mayen Beckmann, the daughter of Max Beckmann, the great German expressionist artist. So when I go to Max... Mayan's house, nowhere else in the world, I could see Giddo's hanging next to Beckman and Dix and Kirchner and it's fantastic, you know, the great German expressionist artist. And when I was there with my son Harley, he was only about 13 in that photo, she said, George, you've got to take Harley to see Sachsenhausen, which was the first concentration camp. And um, every, everyone should know what happened there. And it was the one where Hitler... <coughs> got the SS to train. Every other, um, every SS officer that went and ran every other concentration had learnt how to do their evil stuff at Sachsenhausen and they had this room, uh, let's keep going, where they did human experiments and this terrified Harley, the German efficiency, they made benches to put the people on and the blood would drain down and they'd cut off the top of their skull and put wires in and... Um, you know, they did experiments which are completely inhuman. And so I think probably if, if I was going to die tomorrow and um, someone said, all your work's going to be destroyed by one painting, this next one, that's the painting I'd say represents me the best. And that's where I think all modern evil started at Sachsenhausen. And um, that's my painting about Sachsenhausen. Um, this is... Uh, the, the main painting that I did um, during the Iraq War, it's called The Last Nail. And um, Blake did a very interesting series of, uh, of works about Pilgrim's Progress, but he also did one of Nebuchadnezzar, who's sort of down like that, and I loved it. And here's the suicide bombers and, the, uh, and Civil War. And I put up a little picture up at the top, it's a Leon Golub, and um, that's him, the artist at home, comfortable in his bed with his wife. And so often that's where I'd rather be <laughs> in these war zones. And it's, it is that thing of um, the artist can... Uh, there's a book on Golub called... the uh, Not Leon Golub, uh, Philip Guston, I mean. Philip Guston in bed with his wife, with his paintbrushes. And um, a long, long way from the war in in Iraq and uh, it's been very prophetic. I, I anticipated that um, uh, America's intervention would lead to endless civil war and that's what's happening now. We've got the attack going on as we speak in Mosul and Syria is a, is a result of it as well. And there was a bridge where there was a car where there'd been an old couple who the man was trying to get his wife to hospital and the Americans thought they were suicide bombers <coughs> and killed them and they're uh, skeletons were still sitting like that in the car. Um, okay, let's go. This is, I was the first person into Abu Ghraib and we looked at Sachsenhaus and the other turning point place in modern history is Abu Ghraib. Um, I, the Abu Ghraib was the terrible prison where Saddam tortured people and put his political enemies. And let's keep going. And... Um, Immediately, uh, Saddam left the city, the guards left Abu Ghraib and people vandalised his image. That was in the middle of Abu Ghraib. 
And um, it was very dangerous, but I felt that I had to be there. And it turned out that morning the guards had killed the last of, they'd hung the last of um, Saddam's enemies. Uh, Saddam didn't want them ever in a court case telling stories about him. And I got there and um, on the ground, uh, that's it up the top, um, it's the gallows and no one could, the relatives were outside but no one would go in because most of these places are booby trapped as you'll see now in Mosul. It's very dangerous going in anywhere like this. And I discovered something, this is what I call the executioner's art. The executioner actually puts soft tissue around the neck, around the noose, before he puts it over the person's neck. And so that at least they have the decency of not feeling the rough, the roughness of the, um, of the noose on their flesh. And so when it's pulled tight, you can see it's stained with their sweat and their skin. And um, the relatives came in, and they were so, this is one of the relatives, they were so... Um, used to asking, taking orders, they said, we can't find the bodies of our loved ones. They saw their names listed on the wall, those who'd been killed that morning. And they looked to me and they said, you think we could take the nooses? It's got just the sweat and the skin, but we're Muslims and we'll bury the nooses. And I gave them permission to take the nooses. And as they left, they turned to me and they said, you know, George, if... The Americans do nothing other than level this place to the ground. We will love them and we'll say it's worth all the destruction of our city and all the death and everything else. But what the Americans do, they expanded it. And we've all seen the photographs of what they did to the people in there. Worse than Saddam, the human pyramids of naked men, the women with dogs and naked men. And um, that's where Baghdadi, who created IS, was put into Abu Ghraib and... So the Americans had turned people in that jail, a lot of them were just ordinary butchers, bakers and carpenters, they weren't terrorists. The Americans just had a quota that they wanted a lot of people in jail so they were rounded up at night. That's how he converted them into ISIS and that's how ISIS was created. So this is the place, this is the place that is where it all started. If this had been levelled, maybe we would not have the suffering we're seeing in Aleppo today. And um, when I walked away from there, I knew, having covered many, many wars, I knew that the bodies wouldn't be far, and if I looked for dogs, I'd know where they were. And uh, we'll keep moving, because it's upsetting. But um, that's, that's, uh, <coughs> that's what, um, what they were, but thank God the parents never saw it. This is um, the film I was making, Soundtrack to War. And um, what I decided to do, just like with the poets in Nicaragua, was show the soldiers, the American soldiers, these poor kids, and um, coming, coming there and still playing their American, you know, their rap music, their heavy metal music, and uh, that, you know, that, that's still my most successful film. I was also shooting Fahrenheit 9-11 for Michael Moore. And uh, while I was there, I met Eliot Lovett. And Eliot is a genius, a great urban poet, rapper. And uh, he, they have rap battles. You know, this is at Uday's palace. He's holding his gun, luxury that he's never known. The ghettos of America are more desperate than anything I've seen in South Africa, anywhere like uh, Soweto. And I said, Eliot, you're a genius. I hope you're looking after yourself. He said, no, I've been on 200 combat missions. I said, oh, Elliot. He said, don't worry, George, it's much safer here than it is in Brown Sub, where he came from. So that, for me, that was a film. So after Soundtrack to War, I followed him back to Brown Sub. So there he is at the top at the pool at Uday's Palace. And I discovered the real thing he wanted was to introduce me, him, me to his brother, Marcus Lovett, who only spoke in rhyming couplet, couplets. It was like going back to the days of... Shakespeare. Uh, he was such a poet, he didn't speak normally. Everything was creative language. And uh, Eliot really just wanted me to be there to help uh, Marcus become a star and get the family out of poverty. And um, there I am with Alton, who's 
he's a playwright, another brother, and Alton started helping me make the film and he'll be helping me make the film that we start in a couple of weeks. Um, then here's Marcus and the sad thing is while we're making that film, uh, Marcus was murdered by another gang and um, that's the tragedy of the film. And recently, um, let's go to the next shot, Denzel, who was another genius who I tried to get a record deal for, uh, he's now 10 years on, he's now in his 20s, he's got five kids. Uh, he was recently shot three times in the lung and uh, he was attacked with such heavy machine gun fire that it cut the house behind him in half and the house collapsed. Imagine that. It's the, sort of the only sort of thing you'd see in a war zone like Baghdad or Aleppo, but this is America. And as he lay in the gutter, his heart actually stopped and he saw the white light that many people see when they have a near-death experience. And he wrote a poem about it. Never think anyone would hear, hear it. And the poem's about how his brother was killed in the same way when he was 20 years old. And the paramedics just arrived in time and they put those electric things and they restarted his heart and he remembered the poem. And he's just uh, performed it for me on Skype and the shivers went down my back. And that's how my m new movie will start with the blown up house, the gutter, the story and then Denzel performing his rap about the white light. I'm thinking, of, I'm work titling the film Brown Sub but I'll probably call it White Light. And here's our yellow house, there's the old um, Sufi. If Helen had been here today, she would have sung for you. And uh, this is our film Miscreants of Tallywood. That's what got me started with this whole thing. Um, I actually became a star of Pashtun movies, I still am. I'm one of the biggest, uh, I'm one of the biggest producers of Pashtun movies in the world. So when I drop into a place like Dubai, people run up and ask me for my autograph, not realising that I'm actually an Australian. <laughs> this is just my alter ego. And uh, these are some of the movies I've made in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, you know. So mainly what we do are, are films featuring women, that's talk show. And... Um, <coughs> It's uh, a way of reaching, uh, bringing about social change without war or anything like that. So a talk show, for example, the one in the top there is about a woman who comes, who's been educated in Pakistan, comes back to Afghanistan and decides to become like Oprah Win Winfrey and does a talk show, something that was impossible at that time. Women, women were not allowed on television. And um, then she starts fighting corruption and uh, enormously successful film and now women are doing talk shows and uh, so that's the kind of breakthrough we're doing. Uh, my partner Helen has sung on national television. Women have never been allowed to sing before and now other women are singing. We're creating these incredible changes in a very, very positive, creative way. Keep going. And they, oh, and so who'd ever think that a boy from Rockdale growing up in Villiers Street, playing football for St George, would end up running a, um, a circus in Afghanistan. That's my circus truck, that's my troupe, and that's our film Love City. And um, this is shooting a scene at Tora Bora. Now, the Americans have never been able to take uh, their um, special forces soldiers, no fighting force has actually been able to go to Tora Bora because it's so heavily controlled by Taliban and other insurgents and yet we've made our films there and so uh, <coughs> Paul Jordan who's a good mate who was a special forces friend of mine at Kibaya said, you know, in, in um, something he wrote about me, he said, uh, uh, you know, he's like that doctor who said George is one chop short of the barbie, he said, um, you know, not only is George taken a circus to Tora Bora, this is a place where you're not supposed to have singing, dancing, film or anything else, but he actually filmed it. So it's in my film Love City. And I should make a plug now, uh, SBS are uh, running a retrospective season of my film starting 6th of November. And so all of my films, right back to Bullets of the Poets, you'll be able to watch and download. And they're calling that a stunt. So it'll be George Bush, Hillary, oh, sorry, not, it'll be uh, it'll be Trump, Clinton and Giddos <laughs> on SBS for a, 
a couple of weeks there. And uh, I think that's quite funny. They're calling it a, a stunt. So I'm the padding in between the, uh, the election and then the election results. But please tune into that and you can see all of my films. This is our circus tent. I've made it a lot higher since then because we've got aerial acts now. And that's my monkey, um, Dali. I called after Salvador Dali. And um, he, he's the key to it. I, I never thought I'd become a monkey trainer. But I, I arrive uh, and in one of these villages with my little monkey and I go ahead of everyone else because I'm not threatening, I'm an old man. And uh, the kids come out and Dali starts doing his tricks. And then the Taliban come out and they're not happy, you know, the circus is coming to town. And um, we get all the children together, the tent's up, and we've got a lovely little flap in the tent that's Dali's entry point. So Dali shoots in there, all the kids follow him, we haven't asked permission, and then he climbs up the centre pole of the circus and slides down like a little fireman. And he's got like a little fireman's uniform. And we've got a whistle that goes down to the ground. He does that three times, he's laughing and by then even the Taliban are belly laughing and we can do anything, you know. So, you know, you can't have a circus without at least one exotic animal. And that's uh, Helen in the kitchen at the Yellow House and her shed and that's our, um, our uh, cross-dressing cook, um, Ishrad, we call him Itchy. I love Itchy, you know, he's... Um, he prefers to wear women's clothes, but when things, when the going gets tough, then Itchy gets tougher. He's out there with a gun or whatever is needed to protect the Yellow House. He's a great and brave soul, very much the heart of the Yellow House. And oh, go back. So I, I sort of use this. No, just go back one. I use this. No, no, to the next shot. Oh, that one. Okay. So um, I, all my life, I've used this kind of like voodoo magic where. Uh, the Taliban threatened to cut my head off. So quite often I'll pay someone to shoot me in film. You know, I'll have fake bullets on my chest and I'll be killed. So that's what everyone thinks is going to happen to me. And somehow or other, in my weird ghetto's way, it wards off actually being shot. So we, we reenacted me having my head cut off to a Taliban <laughs> video. <laughs> and uh, keep going. That's Neha, who's a great part of the Yellow House. Keep going. And here we are, no, go back. So then, uh, more or less the day that we did that, the actual Taliban turned up. And this is Malana Hukani. And he's one of the most feared men in the world. Just Google him. And he turned up with all these guys with their guns. This, this guy's a hardened fighter and a hardened killer. And we thought, well, our days are numbered. Helen was out shopping, so I rang her up and said, hey, Helen, be careful coming back in. Normally she comes in, she's got a burqa on, and she just pulls it off and does like a strip tease and laughs because she's, you know, liberates herself from being fully covered. I said, don't do that today. <laughs> Helen came in with her head down and went to the bedroom. If you watch the movie, she then took out of her mouth an automatic handgun and she was prepared to shoot the first thing that came into the room. But... Um, so I sat down with Milana Hakani in our, uh, our cafe thinking this is probably the last minutes of my life and he, he detailed how they'd done a huge investigation into the Yellow House and I thought this is not good. If you see my face in the movie I look very worried. And he said we believe you're doing good for the Afghan people and we're going to support you. So we now have the umbrella of the official Taliban protecting us. And um, he visits regularly, he lets his sons come to the Yellow House. One of his sons, who would probably be his successor, has said, I no longer believe in anything my father believes. So that's really, you could point a gun at that kid's house and he'd shoot you back, but uh, give him paint brushes and cameras and the chance to write a poem and see some pretty girls, um, we'd turn him completely around. And... Um, I think we turned Hakani around as well. He said that if um, the Taliban get involved in the next election, he's going to advocate that there's, for every male candidate, there's a female candidate. So that's the impact of having an art centre in the, in the Yellow House. There's one of my Taliban portraits. And this is in the days when I had, before I'd met Hakani. I don't think he'd be flattered. <laughs> and there he is, you know, uh, at the Yellow House. That's a very historic photograph. Milana Hukani at the Yellow House giving it his blessing. 
And these are our ice cream boys. Uh, we've just finished this film, Snow Monkey. I'll be back in Brisbane on the 24th because it's in the Asia Pacific um, Awards. And uh, these boys distribute our movies and they decided to make their own movie and this is dramatising a time when Zabi, this boy here, was actually stabbed uh, by thieves and so they've created a film about their own lives. It's very popular as a drama in Afghanistan. And then I met the gangsters, that's Bulldog and they're the real driving force of Snow Monkey. And um, there's Steel. And he runs organised, he's only a kid, but he pretty well runs organised crime in Jalalabad. And uh, he believes he's the king of Jalalabad. And, um, you know, I've now got Steele taking lessons from the police chief's son and, uh, um, you know, we might turn him around, he might end up taking over the yellow house and running the art business rather than the crime business. Uh, there, there they are with their masks, introducing them to theatre. And here he is. So, at some point, we, I thought that uh, Steele was the biggest monster, you know, like he cuts kids' faces, he's violent, he extorts money, and then I discovered he was in love, and there's Shazia. And uh, the film became... Some people who've seen it, one of the American reviewers said it's the greatest love story since Bogey and Bacall. And uh, Shazia doesn't want him to be a gangster. She knows he's a little genius. And uh, so Helen's now given her, her a job at the Yellow House. And so every afternoon, Pula comes along, Steele comes along and bangs on the gate and walks home. <laughs> so, you know, the power of art. There he is showing off for Shazia. Uh, and there they are having a romantic walk. And he takes her to this um, the huge mansion. There's only one mansion in Jalalabad and it's owned by the Minister for Customs. Can you figure out why he's so rich in an opium, an, a country that survives on opium? So um, he's obviously taking all the bribes from the opium warlords. And um, Steele says to Shazia, someday this house will be yours. And she said, how will we get the money? And he just smiles lovingly into his face and said, I'll find a way. <laughs> And uh, uh, this film is being distributed all over Italy. Italians love it. They recognise a young godfather in steel. He's totally <laughs> Italian charisma. And so at the end of the film, we take them up to the mountain and uh, there's Murtazar, the music master, and he sings this beautiful song and we let the balloons go. Um, keep going. And whoop, whoop, Yeah, so this is... Um, the boys succeeded... Uh, so the Yellow House has more or less become, as well as a place for older artists, it's become a place for gifted, talented kids who are very poor who would never normally go to school. And so this is a huge achievement. That's their film, Snow Monkey. You know, if, if you're into bullshit um, conceptual art, to me that's about as conceptual as it gets. To go to a war zone, help kids to make a movie and then put up a billboard in... Um, in Jalalabad advertising the movie, a city where film and music have been banned for decades. And there goes the, the billboard. Um, keep going. There they are, being proud of it. And here's the old Sufi. And he was the greatest thing to come to the Yellow House. Um, Sufis uh, don't... They like the Quran, but they say that... Wisdom is not in a book and the whole thing behind Sufism is finding um, who you are, um, find, uh, you know, your own personal journey, whether it's using religion or just music or art or whatever. So he was t teaching Sufism and music and shamanism but all the other Sufis in Jalalabad had been killed. He explains how uh, they'd cut their heads off and put any money they'd made into their asses and float them down the river. And um, keep going. So there he is, I'm doing his portrait. And here he is teaching. These kids are Aboriginal children, they're coochie, like he is. And he's also te teaching them ancient traditions of shamanism, which they use to make their living. Um, and there's Zabi. And uh, Zabi's my most talented student. He shot a lot of the film. And he was one of the ice cream boys and uh, this is going to be one of my last stories but it's the most gratifying thing that's happened to me at the Yellow House. He was taken 
captive by IS, by Daesh, these terrible people that are doing all the <coughs> bad things in Syria and Iraq and everywhere else, and they're in Afghanistan as well. And what they do, they get taller boys like, uh, kidnap taller boys like Zabi and make them carry their guns from one point to the other so that if the American helicopters and drones see someone carrying guns, they'll um, kill them and not the actual fighters. So it's very cowardly. And uh, Zabi did that with him. He saw terrible things, including the murder of a baby in front of its parents. And we thought he was lost to us. And one day I was sitting in the kitchen of the Yellow House and suddenly this little shadow went past the kitchen window. And I thought, that couldn't be Zabi, could it? And it was. And he came in. He was so emotional. It took him hours before he could even speak. And he just went around the Yellow House touching all the flower power points because electricity is still a miracle to these kids, uh, just being, having working electricity. And then he went to the room where we keep all the cameras and found no one had touched his camera and he took it out and played with everything and then he came out with a camera and he said to me, George, this is how I'm going to fight Daesh, how I'm going to fight IS, I'm going to do it with a camera and not with a gun. And we've been able to get him work with news and he's now shooting news stories about Daesh and exposing their atrocities. I keep going. And um, the worst thing that happened to me recently in Afghanistan, I'm still recovering from it, was um, there was a terrible bombing, uh, suicide bombing at the Kabul Bank. It's in the film. Many, many people were killed. And I went down in the morning. IS had done it. Zabi filmed it. And I wanted to do interviews with witnesses. And it was a very dangerous atmosphere. Eventually IS came, but no one else came, and it was clear that they were ready to kill me. And so we left, and I went back to a cafe in, in the park where I have a friend. And women are not allowed into the cafes. And I saw this beautiful coochie woman just standing nervously outside the cafe. It's an open cafe. And suddenly she took the step of coming in. And a shiver went down my spine. I knew that she had bad news about the old Sufi. And so he'd gone on a little bit of a musical tour and Daesh had found him, Ayas had found him in a park. They smashed his, um, you know, his harmonium and then they cut out his tongue and then they removed his head. And um, it's a huge loss to us. So I was devastated and I thought, what can I do? And in my weird artist way, I thought... I used to love sitting on the Kabul River with, um, with the old Sufi, watching the eagles. He loved the eagles. So we went, I went down with my group down to the river, got there. It was such a black day. Hunters had come and shot all the eagles. There were just dead eagles everywhere. And um, a little boy came up to me with a, a dead bird in his hands, not an eagle, and he was crying and... He wanted to come out and show me what had happened. And as I was walking out, I, w I decided to lie down and get a shot of the river and the rocks and I was going to film the eagles. And suddenly one of the rocks looked at me. It was like it blinked. It had a human eye in it. And I took this photograph and a couple more. There it is. And I stood up and when I picked it up, it was probably the only fragment remaining of the very, very, very ancient... Uh, Buddhas that were in the caves. You know, the, Jalalabad was the oldest dest Buddhist place in, you know, the, one of the first Buddhist places, and it was actually where the skull of the relic of the skull of actual Buddha was in those caves. And the Taliban had smashed all the sculptures, pushed them in the river, and I found this fragment. And it was to me, it was like the old Sufi had reached out to me and said, "Hey, George, I'm all right. I'll see you on the other side." Um, so there it is. <laughs> And keep going. And then um, I came back and that's my design for the Peace Prize. And uh, that was the most beautiful day of my life. Not getting the Peace Prize, but the day after the Peace Prize, I went to Cabramatta High School, which is Cabramatta in Western Sydney is where they absorbed most of the refugees. And there were these two young Syrian refugee girls who just arrived in Australia <coughs> from from Aleppo and I put my hand around theirs and they had a little white dove in their hands and they were trembling and we held up and we let it go. There it is flying away and all the other children had these 
doves and they flew around in spirals. And I'll just never forget that day. It was so beautiful. Um, the uh, other children, the ceramics teacher had gotten them all to make um, ceramic tiles of yellow houses from their country. So in the garden there were hundreds of yellow houses and it made me realise that we've got to try and you know, get an Aboriginal yellow house in Burke, another one in Brown Sub, another one in you know, Gaza and I've got all of those on the boil. You know? um, and so it's sort of like the kids were, were you know, doing a, a premonition of what I want to do with the rest of my life. So that's the talk. <laughs> Thank you.